What's up, guys? Welcome back to the podcast. We have a new story, and I, I think <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll, we'll introduce you right now. But Robert, I mean, going from the Queen Isabella stuff to what we're going to talk about, um, I'm both. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, I'm excited and, and a little scared, to be honest with you, a little nervous. Um, this is going to be an interesting journey. Yeah. Because I'm finding out things that I know you all are going to freak out about when you're here. So, Juan, please introduce yourself and let everybody know. Give them, I guess give them a little bit of context about what we're going to talk about. Uh, my name is Juan Carmona. I'm a social studies teacher down in high school, also a dual enrollment prof- professor at for South Texas College. Um, I teach U.S. history and Mexican-American history. I'm also the author of The Alton Bus Crash. And... Um, that is something that you know I've had a connection with since I was when it happened, and even before then, I had connections with buses. You know, um, a bus accident that really just stuck in my head. So next time I heard a bus accident, it's always even to this day when I hear about it, that one image of of um, that accident I witnessed when I was a child will always pop in my head. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting story, and I think coming from the Queen Isabel Causeway, since it was such a a tremendous story, and you told it so well, Robert. Uh, we wanted to follow up with something that is just as big and as grand and, and has a Rio Grande Valley impact. I think, mm-hmm. I think that's super important. You're um, really for the valley. Like, you mm-hmm. want to preserve mm-hmm. the valley history. Yeah, um, that's one thing I'm really into. And it's, when you say, like, the impact on the valley, it had a nationwide impact. Any bus your child rides today is redesigned because of that accident. That's wow. crazy. And it's things like that that we're going to uh, get into and look at. And uh, basically the same thing that we did for the for the Causeway collapse was we took a part of our South Texas history that has basically become obscured. And it's kind of a, a faint memory in the back of our minds. And, um, and we're going to bring those to light and we're going to share... Um, Everything you know, the details about uh, you know how the accident happened, and 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 we're going to go into real depth as to what, again, twenty some odd years of history and ripple effects have uh, have produced for individuals, um, new laws, things on, on how buses work and mm-hmm. safety mechanisms. So we're gonna we're gonna you know we're gonna visit all those things with Juan's help. Okay. And and as always, the the comment section really helps us out. If if you all comment with people that you know that might have been in this or were affected by it, reach out to us because that's literally how the Queen Isabella Causeway stuff was was so impacted. It was literally through the comments. Yeah, it was fuel, fueled by you all. Josh and I had no idea that we were gonna turn this into a documentary. Um, it literally, that uh, idea and that motivation was birthed through all of the YouTube comments and you all saying, hey, this needs to be a movie. You guys need to write a book. You guys need to do this. And, and so basically you guys produced it. Um, positivity and enthusiasm is something that uh, artists and people like Juan and Josh and myself need. You know, because we have the ideas, and I think some some of us realize that we have the abilities, but we don't have the confidence. So, so the the definitely comment and suggest and 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 let us know uh, what path we need to take this story on. Because as of right now, it's just going to be a podcast. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what we're looking at, and hopefully. If there is enough uh, detail and interest from you guys, we can take that and uh, and turn that into motivation and 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 give it some visual, uh, you know, visual aids in in the form of a of a documentary like we did with uh, the collapse. Absolutely, and uh, you had actually a really good story about about the Alton bus crash, but we'll get into that in a yes. bit. So, Juan, take us on a, take us on this journey, man. Um, September, September 21st, 1989, um, mission school bus number six was going, um, was picking up the last group of students in Alton back then, Alton, um, Alton children attended mission consolidated independent school district. And, um, so they were on their way to mission and, um, when they had picked up the, the last of them and it will School buses used um, usually have two routes. The first route is young kids, and then the second route is the middle school and high school kids. So these are the older kids. They, the little ones had already been picked up, so that was the first route. And then the second one, um, you know, was with the middle school and high school kids, and those were the kids that were in that bus that day. Um, what did the ages range from? 
um, 18 to, I want to say 12 or 13. Wow. Um, and they were, you know, and, and there was um, 53 people aboard that bus when it was finally. 53. When, it was, when, it was, when the last kids get in. At the same time, um, Ruben Pena is just um, working for Valley Coca-Cola, has um, stopped at a Circle K and delivered his first load, which is really important because he'd only unloaded one one load there. So his truck, truck was, was heavy. pretty pretty heavy, pretty full at that time. So as there as um, he's going north um, on um, Brian. on Brian and the and the bus was coming, let's see, east to west. He's moving north and his his loader because every truck has a loader, the person who helps unload the things. So you have the loader and the driver. And his loader um, notices he's not slowing down. And he points out, hey, there's a stop sign ahead. And according to Ruben, and all this becomes in contestation, is that he immediately put the brakes, but that they didn't work. So then he shifts to the to the um, to his truck brake. And even the kids on the bus witnessed that they said they saw a truck coming really fast. And um, and so most kids aren't paying attention. If you just got a picture of high, junior high, high school students are chatting, they're moving around. A the lot attention of attention span is very and they're sure. you know they're all over and the and place. But some kids did see it approaching. And aside fast. from that, those buses are like their homes. I mean, they're traveling them. They yeah. trust them. They're not they trust them. you know their hands are in the in the hands of the of the driver. The, the, so of the dr- yeah, they're the not bus driver. you know gazing out the windows. They're you yeah. know doing their thing. Wow. And some kids yelled, and the bus driver tried to turn away to the right, which pushed him into. The well, you got him kind of set up for what was sadly about to happen. Now, a little background is Alt- Alton, Texas, is um, especially in the early 20th century, was famous for its caliche. Um, in, 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 in history, you call that era the Gilded Age, and they're building all the skyscrapers. Guess where all that concrete and stuff was coming from? A lot of it was from Alton, Texas. So Alton is riddled with pits mm-hmm. all over. Mm-hmm. And at that time, there was no laws. That's other things that, cha- that have changed um, as far as like the regulation of open pits. Now you have to have faces, fences, you have to have barriers. All that changes because of this accident. That's why I said it's, like, it's not just like a local impact. It has a national I grew impact. Up in, um, I grew up working in, uh, in in uh, a Kalicha pit on really? Stewart Road, just oh. down the ways they belonged to my parents. It was called Chrome Kalicha pit back in the day. Oh, so you and, know what I'm uh, talking about that. It was a 22, it wound up being a 22 acre um, pond because what happens, everybody, is that as as these big machines are excavating and mining the caliche, they have to go through several layers of topsoil and different types of dirt. And then they get to this rock and then they they rip it and they get it all out. Well, as they're going down, eventually these pits meet our natural water table. And once you hit that water table and you breach it, water will begin to fill your pond. So this caliche pit that he's talking about had already reached and breached that first water table. So not only was it a deep pit um, of rock, but there is water filled in it. Yeah, if you take the short drive out there, you'll see there's still water out there. It's, it's yeah. kind of an awe-inspiring oh, yeah. thing is to see that. To see that yeah. When when I was there a few years ago, we never quite figured out what it was. Is there were there were some pipes sticking out of the, wall, the rock wall, draining mm-hmm. water, mm-hmm. drainage water. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah because yeah. Th- these pits, um, again, haven't been grown up on one. Eventually, when they are rendered useless, the cities and the municipalities around there utilize them as detention ponds and retention ponds so that when there's a, a, a crap ton of rain and, and like West Laco mm-hmm. and, and you know, where road over here on the expressway that fill up, um, basically what they wind up doing is that they take these these deep pits, these caliche pits, and they, they, will, they will run runoff water and run drainage lines to them because they're so, they're so deep and there's such a vast amount of acreage that is useless. You can't build on it. It would take too much to refill them. Um, so we run our water to it so that it alleviates the flooding in some of our streets. Hmm. Yeah, so the the pit was you know pr- pretty full of water, enough water for when the accident happens to f- cover a bus on its side. That's how that's how deep the water was. Wow. But in um, so going back to what would happen is, is he turns to the right to try to get away from him. 
um, the impact does occur. There's two initial Im two impacts. First is the front end of the Dr. Pepper truck kicks the side of the bus. But then more so, though, and that's the one that really caused the accident, was the trailer, which was full of beverage. Like I said, he'd only so left... So jackknifed. It. Wow. So what yeah. happened? <laughs> Again, growing up on a yeah. caliche pit, <laughs> we always had 18-wheelers in and out of these pits. And, you know, we'd load them up with caliche and they'd be on their way. When a, when a truck... Um, is pulling a trailer and the load of the trailer is heavier than the actual truck pulling it. When this truck slams on its brakes, the trailer will continue to push because it outweighs the truck. Well, it'll get to the point to where it pushes it enough to where the trailer will begin to swing around and come around the front. And all you Valley truck drivers know what I'm talking about. This is this is when your truck jackknifes. So what you're saying is that, is it, you see, I didn't know this. Yeah, right? and, so, and it swatted the back of the bus. And it swatted the and back of the bus. And there was a two to four foot in. embankment. And it kind of acted like a ramp. So when it hit, it went over that and landed oh, nose, nose first. first. Wow. And then for a few seconds, and then it fell on its side. No seat belts. No, there's still no seat belts yeah, on buses yeah, to this no day. Belts, it's one thing that no boggles my mind. We're all about seat belts, seat belts, seat belts, except, you know, where we're going to put up 50 kids in. Mm -hmm. um, but so, <laughs> so then when that bus hit, it went straight down. All those mm -hmm. kids had to have. Yeah, um, yeah. the descriptions I read is, well, the person who took the brunt of it, to be honest, is the bus driver because he hits the ground and this windshield comes into his face. The. And then on, with the way it lands is it pretty much traps most of the kids is because it lands on its f nose and then that damages the, the door on the side, the main door. Then when it falls, it falls on its side and the, that emergency exit now has to be pushed up into the water. Waterway. To, and some kids were able to push it up, but it, the force and the gravity of the water pushed it closed. Wow. So that left the only exit in those buses windows. is the windows. And those windows, I mean, I was, I was a kid at that time, and I still remember how hard they were to open because they had these metal latches you had to push in real hard. And there were three settings, so you had to go down one, down another, down another. And it was super difficult to open them. And Even what, while the bus is in perfect condition, yeah, after it having just didn't been really, impacted yeah, and, an accordion, and, you don't even know what the what, what the and, conditions of those windows were. Yeah, and the water is just so murky. Yeah, it's dirty you can, water. You can barely see where you're going. And so um, there were some windows open, but a lot of them were kids struggled to open. Um, because, you know, it, it, tragically, it was in a cool day in September 21st. That doesn't really happen in the valley very often. Normally, all those windows would be open because it's usually warm. But it was a cool day so some of those windows were closed and that was really the only way kids could get out now you also have to picture the fact that like yes they all they fall forward and then someone you know are, are falling but we don't really see a lot of really major injuries the sadly the the kids that passed away drowned because they couldn't get out Wow. Um, and so you can imagine they landed, for it, and it wasn't that bad of an impact. Some of the kids say it wasn't that bad because, you know, it got slowed down by the water. But then, you know, and then it slowly started to fill up and fill up and fill up. And as these kids are trying to get out, you know, the only way out is through the windows. Those that get out try to pull other kids. And, you know, sometimes they're just coming back with hands full of hair. I mean, the, the stories about them getting out are just so tragic and sad and it, it's like when i'm doing interviews it's like i know i'm not gonna go and do a happy thing you're taking tissue with you because it's just you know the stories i heard of like kids being like trying to almost get out but being pulled down by other kids scrambling to get Jeez. out oh and um yeah th those stories are rough to hear but um the ones that like i said who ended up passing um 19 died that day in that scene and three more in the hospital um, but they all died from, you know, drowning from getting wow. lung in their, in, you know, water in their lungs. That, that is a tremendous event that happened. It's crazy. Robert, when we were chatting the other day, you were kind of, that you were kind of telling me about how life was back then. Can you kind of repeat that? Yeah. Cause you see back then, at least it was for me in my neck of the woods, we had horses and we would literally ride. Um, I grew up on the Seven Mile Line and La Homa Road. Um, pretty much born and raised there. And each of my siblings and I, my parents, we all had horses. And back then, if we wanted to go to the store to the little Lucky Seven on Five Mile Line or something, we'd saddle up and we'd ride out there. So it wasn't very uncommon to see 
um, horses out, you know, people riding. And a lot of us, a lot of times, would encounter car accidents and bus accidents, not bus accidents, I'm sorry, <laughs> but, but car accidents and just traffic accidents. Um, and the first thing that, that somebody riding on a horse does when, when you know, you see an accident on the side of the road is you ride out there to try to render some kind of aid. I heard, and maybe you've mm-hmm. heard about this, about a gentleman yeah, who that's was on what a I was horse. Gonna, yeah, I was going to, the minute you said it, uh, Roca Sosa, uh, to me it was one of the craziest stories I heard. And, and I, I talked story ta- I was telling you. Yeah, I, I, um, I just, there's a whole bunch of things that make it special but I just think how quickly this man thought. Like, it's not just what he did, but but the fact that he thought so quickly. What ends up having one of the main people I interview is is Alex De Leon. And Alex De Leon gets out of the bus, you know, helps some people out. Then he hears... Just from, uh, I call it a cliff. You know, his, yeah, it's a cliff. It, yeah, that's like a, a 20, 20 uh, foot drop. And, you know, Alex, someone calling him his name, calling him his name. And not la la, Alex, not la la. So he's like, you know, swim to the edge. So he sees something thrown down, which he thinks is a rope, and he swims to the edge. And he grabs it. It's actually two water hoses tied together. And he starts to pull Alex up, and Alex is freaking out because he's moving real fast. Like, this dude is super strong. Till he gets to the top, and he realizes that Roque had used his horse to pull him out. And he rec- the reason Roque knows him, and most of the kids knew him, is because he had a little ranch, and he would break horses, and he would let the kids ride the horses. That's how they all knew each other. It was real common for us back yeah. then. On the weekends, we'd all get together, and, and horses and their riders would come over to my dad's house, or we'd congregate at a different ranch so lo que es alton 107 seven mile line five mile line I eran por ranchitos, you know and uh, all the way up to conway and all the way up past you know western road and stuff so on the weekends pues se juntaba toda la gente and we'd be out there roping riding jumping it's just a normal it, thing it was just a normal yeah. thing for us so when i heard this story it made so much sense and i've told people about this horseback rider and it seems to baffle them, but what they don't understand is the that's community we're talking about. That that's the way our life was back then. Wow. I mean, 20, 20 some odd years now, it seems odd. But yeah, I know he was a real hero. Yeah, and to me, just like the thought, because he was there, sh- real shortly after the accident, that he must have stopped, paused, un- unscrewed some. Probably like, I don't have any rope. Let me get or long enough yeah. rope. I got wow. two hoses together and rode out. You know, you just the, the quick response and the quick thought of that man is just amazing. So for y'all who haven't visited or, or are maybe listening to uh, this podcast and are not from the Valley or haven't ever seen, let me just kind of paint a really simple picture for you. So if you can close your eyes and picture yourself at a stop, at a four-way stop, actually, no, a two-way stop. Um, you got west and eastbound traffic and you got north and southbound traffic. Well, the north and the southbound are the ones that are have stops. Um, on one of these corners, actually, it's the northwest corner. Mm-hmm. After the stop, it's just a drop. There's no. Yeah, it's literally road. right it's there. Just mm-hmm. Right there, right off the road. If you, you know, I'm talking maybe just a few feet. So even him, and there was no fence back mm-hmm. then or anything. So even him riding up close next mm-hmm. to it. He could see down. I mean, mm-hmm. it wasn't. There's no trees obstructing the view. There was literally nothing it was protecting an open any vehicle. Pit. It was it's just an open pit on the side of a of what is now today mm-hmm. a very very major mm-hmm. road. Yeah. Um, and I I just think about like there was like I think two weeks before that there was an accident as well. Mm-hmm. A car went in there. Mm-hmm. So and they were already discussing maybe we should do something about it. But it became that game of oh it's not the city it's a county oh no it's not the county it's the state yeah, oh, I know that's a railroad commission and you know that. That just yeah, kind of, and finally for, after yeah. the accident they pass a law to <laughs> ensure that yeah. all pits are closed. But if you look, it's always amazing when I look at some of the footage or the pictures. It's just like how huge it was yeah. and how open it was. And yeah, well, you got to understand that while they're mining, mm-hmm. the caliche, the truck, the eighteen wheelers literally have to drive all the way in there. You're talking acres of mm-hmm. just of just pit Jeez. of just a pit mm-hmm. and. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I I grew up listening and hearing the story about the writer that he took not only one person, but apparently he helped several yeah. children out. And I heard the story that he was lassoing kids up, but apparently now it, it turns out to be a, a garden hose. <laughs> yeah, it was a garden hose. That's Talk crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I just, that's to me like you think that you know, maybe it wouldn't make sense. Yeah, he was riding his horse yeah. and he was rope with him, but the fact that like, oh, you know, he just quickly. Well, the thing is that I've, it, it, it has, again, being around, you know, ranch and farm animals and things of that nature, 
to to lift somebody up dead weight to pull them up with a lasso mm -hmm. those lassos are so thin and sharp almost mm -hmm. um it i i can see how it would have injured them more it would have injured them mm -hmm. you know just as much as whatever yeah, dragging they them that many feet dragging them that many feet up in the air so uh, a water hose that has some sort of <laughs> elasticity, <laughs> you know a, a elasticity or whatever whatever that is it's stretching it i can see how that would have made sense to mm -hmm. somebody wow yeah. wow yeah. Yeah, it's it's one Florida of the, yeah they're they're like you know there's some um, <coughs> truly tragic stories and then there's just truly heroic stories um, at the at the same time but that's like with any and all tragedy as as you're aware mm -hmm. of now you'll they hear go some hand really, in hand. yeah it's it's just like night and day <clears throat> or you know good and evil and and all of that stuff it's the yin and the yang of every tragic accident. Sometimes the positive stuff is revealed later mm -hmm. in life, you know, and sometimes, and sometimes it happens simultaneously as the tragedy is happening. Something, something amazing and wonderful and, and very, very uh, endearing is also going on at that same moment. So, yeah, those things go hand in hand. You can't but get away from one or the other. I think another way to understand just how deep it was is um, our, there, there's te there's um, testimony of a kid who missed the bus. And his dad put him on a car to take him, and they heard the crash. Oh my God! But they turned around, and all they saw was a Dr Pepper truck because the bus was gone. gone. Wow! Yeah. And so yeah, they just no, kept it's, going. It, it, it's if if you can imagine yourself in a car uh, on the road at a four-way stop. I'm sorry, at a two-way stop. Um, you can literally look look out the side and see the pit and its depth. So it was. I can see how the the so the bus, the was, bus completely was completely out of it. Was gone. Like yeah, if you yeah. if you were look, you'd have to look down. Yeah, you'd have to get there yeah. And look down if you were just it. standing on the road, you just see that as the kid saw a Dr yeah. Pepper truck like yeah. on the side, but that was um the bus was in, in the pit. I mean, another person, uh, I think it was Luis Guerrero, was a diver, and he got there shortly after. And you talk about you know heroism. That guy pulled out over eleven people, wow. um, no gear. <laughs> Um, stopping to sometimes like, give him first aid, all that, and and he was just going and going till the when the next medic showed up, and he literally collapsed in their arms because he was just so exhausted. Fatigued, yeah. And the bus driver too, the bus driver, um, you know, sadly, he's, you know, he's, he's yelling, "No, it's me, me culpa, and it's not my fault." And it wasn't. Um, and he's all cut up, but him too are just pulling as many kids as he can out of it. And you know, every, everyone, you know, everyone. You know, it becomes a really chaotic scene, kind of like what you described, because everybody and anybody, and you know, you know, you know, with great intentions, shows up to help. So you end up with border patrol, state, you know, state troopers, local police, county, um, firefighters from all kinds of from all the city nearby cities, um, all, and then just other people just stopping to try to help. So it becomes a very chaotic scene. Um, I know that. I don't think anyone had ever thought to do a mass casualty drill like that. And I know later I became a paramedic and we would actually drill mass ca casualty drills, but I'm not sure if they were doing them at that time. It was, a, you know, it was everyone, you know, with the best intentions, but a very uncoordinated effort. But everyone just doing the best they can because, I mean, you hear kids and, you know, you, you snap out of it. I worked in a hospital for years and, you know, especially in the emergency room and stuff. And, you know, people would like, you know, we get all kinds of injuries, all kinds of people, and it just becomes a routine. But when it's a child, everybody, you know, is, is phased by it. Like some people, you need a certain detachment to work in healthcare, but when it's a child, it's a whole different level. Mm -hmm. You know how many times, like, you you know, we would see something tragic with a child and everyone wants to go to the phone to check on their kid or just talk to them. It's funny because at, at, during the during the incident at the, at the causeway, I was ready to leave. I had, and, mm -hmm. and Roland tells me there could be kids in mm -hmm. the water, Robert. Yeah. And it sparks, it ignites something in you like mm -hmm. it's just it's it's the weirdest thing but i'm glad that you just brought that up because you're a thousand percent right a mm -hmm. child is a child whether it's yours mm -hmm. his yeah. or hers or whatever as soon as there's a child suffering or in danger or or needing of some of you, your help it that's that just moves us mm -hmm. in a way that very few things do from the time that the the bus fell in when was the first person there to start helping people pull out I was within minutes because I know when Alex gets out and Roque Sosa pulls him out, there's already a border patrol agent there. And um, 
when you're looking at is I, I always uh, to me when I'm picturing the accident, uh, you got we have to like go back in time. No cell phones. A lot of people didn't have a phone, in, especially in that area. Um, and so it's amazing what word of mouth would do to you. Plus, they were in their neighborhood, so everyone heard a crash. So, you know, we've had people running there and then, you know, calling people. And, you know, the water patrols there immediately. Uh, there was a, a firefighter that was passing by, and they turn around. So it's within minutes. What was the firefighter's name? Do you know? Because he was off duty. Yeah, uh, I want to say it was Luis Guerrero, but I could be wrong. I got to check my notes. Okay. I think it because he ends up he had just passed. And he was off duty. A buddy of mine, yeah. uh, Gil's father. He has pictures of his father in shorts and a white shirt in waist what? deep water. Who was a firefighter back then, and he was one of the first guys there. It's not Al Nye by any chance. God, I'm so embarrassed. I, I'm, okay, I'm ashamed. just checking. His name's is Gilbert. It, Gilbert. Um, um, I have to. I'd have to look at my notes. Um, yeah, I, I remember Luis Guerrero. Al Nye was another one that I remember the name clearly right now. Um, and so it's within minutes, and you know, just it, it sounds horrible, but um, five minutes is brain death. Jeez. Five minutes of the oxygen is brain death. So I mean, I'm a you know I'm amazed that that many kids got out, and then you know people they, they would get out, but they'd had to stand on the on on top of the bus till you know people came with boats and divers and stuff. Um, you know, it's almost amazing that twenty only twenty one kids you know died um, because of the way you know you could only get out the, the windows, and you only really had a few minutes. You know, before um, you know, you would lose consciousness. And these are twelve to eighteen year olds, so yeah. their their mental capability was yeah, man, wow. Yeah, and you know, I I just I I just, like every time I start talking about, it, I can envision everything I was told, and it's just. Like, and you wrote a book about this. Yeah, talk yeah. to me about the book. Um, well, like I mentioned earlier, the book comes about. Um, there, there's sorry, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, to begin with is like I mentioned earlier, um, when I was, I want to say 11 or 12, I was walking home from school and, and I always tell everyone the first person I ever saw die was in a bus accident. And I was walking with my cousin on Highway 83 in Donna and there was like a little convenience store. If you're, if you're standing at Donna High School and you look south in that, like you'll see a store, I think it's a uh, candy place now, but yeah, it's just straight down there. And we were walking right by that store and a bus passed us. And just as it passed, the emergency exit door opened and a kid flew out and literally at our feet and cracked his head open. Wow. And um, I, all I can tell you, and I'll tell you what I remember and then everything else that got filled into me. Um, I remember like looking down, I can still see it in my head right now. And, you know, and my cousin had, you know, was not, you know, moved quicker than me. He grabbed me and we turned and we ran to the convenience store. There's no 911 back then. And so telling the clerk and the clerk said, I don't know the number to the police department because you had to call the police department like directly. Mm -hmm. There was no 911. My cousin yelled at him the number over and over. Um, and that's all I remember. Um, and I see later on um, when people are, you know, being questioned about maybe a sexual assault, and that, that happened years ago, and they're like, "Why can't you remember these things?" And you only remember this. I'm like, I know exactly what they're talking about. I couldn't tell you the time of day. I couldn't tell you anything other than that happened, and I don't remember anything else. I had to ask my cousin to fill in the blanks for me. And he just told me, well, we were there and the cops told us to go away. We're witnesses, really crazy. But they do, they'll go home. And so we walked to my house, which is where we're going. And he told me that we just went into my room and we prayed for him. And then my grandfather picked up my cousin. That was it. And I don't even remember that. In fact, wow. my, I wrote that as the intro to my book. And my dad called me after he read my book and like, why didn't you ever tell me? And I'm like, Dad, I don't remember anything beyond that. <laughs> but every time I hear a bus wreck, that image of that boy at yeah, my feet, it, right it, it, it just pops right back in my head. So bus accidents always stayed in my head. So years later, I'm in high school. I want to say I was a freshman or sophomore. I was 89. Um, and I remember I'm in my Spanish class. And back then, I don't know how schools still do it. I know we don't have that anymore. But they have like office runners, I guess, like kids that help out the office. And this kid came to bring something to my teacher. And she's the one who told us, hey, a bus, there was a bus accident in Alton. And some kids died. And that's all I really had heard. But that's the first thing that popped in my head. And so that story, you know, stayed with me. About a week later, I was in, I was in the band. Um, because that, that happened Thursday. 
And so Friday, um, this, uh, Friday Night Football, they cancel it, of course, and they have a huge um, memorial at Tom Landry Stadium. And one you know, interesting side story is that they said they released, released 21 balloons and that those balloons gathered together by themselves in the middle of the field and went up together. Wow. And everyone took it as a sign that they were together. Wow. I had uh, no idea. Yeah. And so the next week, um, I, uh, we play Mission. And um, that was a, another reason it sticks in my head is that that was a um, very different experience. I, I have no idea how to fully explain the f- atmosphere, but you could feel like anger. You could feel just like it almost was like heat all around of uh, this, you know, it, it's probably it, I just say anger. That's all I can really describe it as. And everyone was on edge. Fights kept breaking out in the field and in the stands. Um, and it got to the point where our band director, usually we, um, we play halftime, of course. Then we usually get like a third quarter to eat. And then we fourth quarter, you know, we finish out. And I was in the loading crew, so we always left early to get all the instrument boxes ready and all that. And so we played halftime. And we're coming off and our band director's like, loading crew start getting everything ready. We're getting out of here. Um, so we do that, and that takes. There's a delay because I, I think I heard l- later that they were trying to figure out a route out. Now, um, but I asked my kids today, who because I'm a teacher, and they say it's not that bad. But I mean, honestly, back then we were in the habit of our uniform bags to put them in the windows of the buses because kids would throw rocks at the buses. Oh, jeez! <laughs> like that was just a common thing. But they, as we're you know as we're doing loading it up, and they're like, not only did they remind us to do that, even though they didn't have to, they're like, if you have small instruments. Put them in the window as well. Wow. Because they were that scared. And sure enough, we, we tried. I know they said that we were taking a back way to get out. But someone shot a pellet gun. And it shattered the window and got into one of our dancers' eyes. I remember seeing the, the ambulance waiting for us at the high school when we got there. So another reason that stayed in my head. So years later, me and my brother used to do little short independent films or looking at ideas. And I was like, no one ever did anything about the Alton bus crash. Now, mind you, once again, showing my age, um, no social media, none of that around. We had a real difficult time like trying to, you know, nowadays you can put a Facebook, hey, did anyone remember this? Yeah. And you get a messages back. We, we tried. We interviewed the judge who presided over the case. We interviewed a court reporter and another judge. But that's the only people we got to talk to. And so did a lot of research, but we didn't have enough to work with. So we just kind of left it alone. And I actually ended up using it for my bachelor's thesis. <laughs> I was like, well, I might as well do something with it. And then years later now with all the, you know, the, the social media and stuff, we were able to reach out and do some interviews and stuff. And that's how the, you know, how it all, um, how it all, you know, finally got done. Who, who have you talked to that, that was directly impacted or part of that event? Um, well, Alex De Leon. I, I, now my name's, my, I'm horrible with names. Um, I think it's Cuello Cuellar. Was a, he He's now, I think he's now in Customs of Border Patrol. We, uh, who was also a survivor, um, talked to a witness who um, saw the accident, um, talked to a couple of reporters um, to get their firsthand perspective as they got there pretty quickly. Uh, we talked to the spokesman for Coca-Cola at the time, who strangely turned out to be my, my dad's cousin. Um, talked to a nursing supervisor where I used to work who was around at that time. Um, let's see who else did we talk to. Have you spoken to any of the families that have lost loved ones? Uh, yes. Um, what, reached out to a couple. A couple did want to talk. Um, one just told me, I'll call you back, never got back to me. Talked to uh, a, another lady who lost her sister who told me, you know, uh, you know, a tragic story, but she did not want to go like, can I record you? Can we do a formal interview? And so I just, you know, I had her on the phone. So I was like, well, is there anything you really want? to I'll put it in the book, like anything you really want to. And so she told me that um, that little girl had just learned to sew. She had just finished like, you know, practicing showing off for their mom that she sewed some pants and her mom, she was getting ready for a quinceanera and her mom had made her a quinceanera dress. And sadly, she you know, that that's the dress she wow. was buried in. And another side story she told me is that she, the lady I was talking to, was pregnant at the time. And they were all super excited to see the baby. And of course, she didn't get to see the baby. And she told me it was just so odd that when the baby, you know, the baby and as he got older, would always freak out at the signs of sounds of sirens. Hmm. 
Interesting. Yeah. Can you take us back to what life was like back then? It, this was farm people, right? Mm-hmm. This is this is what they did that they mm-hmm. farmed pretty much. Well, um, I mean, they were um, some of them may have been migrant farm workers, others uh, you know labored there. Uh, the valley looks super different, and it's great that you were describing. The valley was super different than it is yeah, now. We, we uh, again, you know, uh, growing up in in the Alton vicinity. Um, we had juniors, which is still there now, on the five mile line in Conway, on the west side and of Conway. And then on the east side, there was a little, literally a little barn. It was called the Burger Barn. And, and we'd ride our horses from La Homa Road all the way to Conway, which is on 107, and then turn south and go all the way to five mile line. And when we needed groceries and stuff like that, obviously we had cars and stuff, but it, 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 yeah, it was just, you know, it was cooler. You know, the parents were <laughs> off working and doing stuff. And, you know, we'd call them or get the call and, and yeah, go to do, go do this and go do that. Or if we were just going to go visit somebody else. So I wouldn't say that we were all farmers. There were people from all walks of life. But riding your horse to a store or to a friend's house was still very common. You know, we still did all that. Again, no cell phones. I don't even think there were pagers back then mm. yet. Um, All we had were were were, were you know uh, public phones, pay phones. Mm-hmm. Um, the geography. I mean, if you're from yeah. the valleys, mesquites, palm trees, and nopales. Well, on these caliche pits, when you start excavating them down to get to the level where the value is, the caliche. Above you, you leave the the earth untouched. So you'll have trees and things of that nature around these pits sometimes camouflaging the pit. Here, that wasn't the case. There were shrubs, you know, just Mm -hmm. wild weeds growing around. Um, If you found yourself driving west on five mile line on your right hand side was the pit. Mm-hmm. And it continues to be there, you know. Yeah. They've they've since then turned it into a park, and um, and a public area. But uh, I literally the first house that Judy, my wife, and I ever built and moved into right after we got married was on the seven mile line and Bryan Road mm-hmm. on Brazos Street. I still remember the address. It's eighty six zero one Brazos. <laughs> And so Judy worked in West Laco at a doctor's office. And at the time, I was still subdividing properties with my old man. So I literally daily drove past the memorial of wow. where this happened. And um, <clears throat> so it's been that location, that spot, and that accident has been very prominent in my life, even though it had no impact on me. I didn't know anybody. Um, I, uh, I, you know, I, I just heard all of the stories, much like you guys who are listening and, and, and you know, and uh, collecting the information that we're giving you guys. Uh, a lot of us didn't know what happened or, or how people passed or, or, or what the, you know, actual numbers were and how it happened. Josh and I have decided to bring all of these details to you guys. We're hoping that with Juan and the people that he has visited with, and, and hopefully some of you all can help us uh Piece Just, it together. Yeah, piece mm-hmm. it together and paint a a, a a clearer picture of what the history is on this event, you know, mm-hmm. and, and hopefully we can, hopefully that'll bring us to what uh, it has led to, um, you know, all these years later. You know what I found mm-hmm. interesting is this was all, these were, it was a lower income, right? Mm-hmm. And when they got their money, this is where the greed starts mm-hmm. coming. in. Can you touch on that part? Yeah. Um, one thing, well, there's a couple, like the whole, <laughs> that, that is its own little hornet's nest. But um, one thing you can start by talking about is, um, you know, these people had never been exposed to that kind of money ever in their lives. And also, a lot of people don't know how lawsuits work. Like, I don't know how lawsuits work. Because there's, there's, you know, there's talk about, like, well, there was a language barrier, which there was. Sometimes they gave them contracts in English, and they had no idea. But I would hazard a guess, even if they read English, even, you know, I don't know what a standard lawsuit contract was. And, uh, you know, law- lawyers charged higher fees, higher percentages. Some of them did. Um, but going back to the amount of money, like, um, they, they had never dealt with money like that so you know stuff that they don't think about kind of like lottery winners is like i can buy a big house which you can but you don't understand taxes on the house like you know now i mean you're gonna be paying so much taxes every year and you only get a one-time check 
So, you know, um, some a lot of people bought houses that they could later not keep. And you also had, you know, um, you know, kids, you know, blowing money and it becomes its own, you know, there's a sad story about two kids who, who died in a sports car that they got the money from, you know, because one of their siblings had died. In fact, I, when I was a paramedic, I worked with a, a medic who actually attended that accident. And he could tell me like to this day, I can't remember the name of the George Strait song, but it was still playing and the, the radio was still going wow. when they got there. And he says, every time I hear that song, I think about those poor kids. What happens is, and I really want to elaborate on mm -hmm. this because it happens to us and to people from humble beginnings and who, again, just don't have the comprehension of what having that kind of money can lead to. And you're talking about millions of dollars, right? Um, the mo I think the high highest paid was like eleven, and then the survivors got anywhere from three hundred to five hundred thousand. Like if if you were a child on that bus who survived, you got like three hundred to five hundred thousand. And if you were a po so, then the highest paid family got mm -hmm. a total of eleven. Yeah, right? and there was even lawsuits amongst the families because some got more than others, and like wow. how come he got more? And it, you know, there's the the legal end of this thing is it, it's sad. I was talking about it being a compounded tragedy because you have the tragedy, then you have the tragedy of the legal infighting, but then you also have, and it, it was one thing that um, I when I interviewed a couple, I guess a, a couple of survivors, they didn't really want to touch on it. But what happened in Alton at that time and the infighting within the community itself? Yes, at first there's this big, you know, everyone bringing, you know, donations and helping. But then as money starts rolling in, jealousy start happening, even within the mayor's office, and it just, you know, that you introduce money and it's just like all kinds of things happen, you know. And you know, some people make good, some people, you know, we we, we you know, one of them became a lawyer people used it for their education to do different things but you know you also have that tragedy of a lot of people going through that money and losing their homes and stuff like that it's because when you have access to that kind of that amount of money any amount of money really and you are suffering from either PTSD or the loss of a child you know, if you lose your, your spouse, if you lose your husband, you're a widow. Mm -hmm. If you lose your wife, you're a widower. I'm, yeah, a widower. They're literally, there's no, there's no word for, for when you lose a child. It's that ugly of a situation. Mm -hmm. It's that difficult of a situation that we can't even put a word on it. So you take that pain and then to pacify it, you give them money. Money without... Uh, education, money without treatment, and I'm talking about mental treatment. Um, the way we award settlements nowadays is, I, I believe it to be all wrong, man. I mean, I get the money part about it. I get how that soothes you, but it also gives you the ability to to click and buy anything and to get that dopamine, that feeling, that, that, that satisfaction that I, I'm able to so afford something and it distracts you from the pain just long enough until you have to go click again and buy something else and then before you know it again your taxes are eating you up there's fees there's losses and we don't know how to we don't know how to manage that money especially people from Alton who were mm -hmm. back then who were from really really humble beginning mm -hmm. hard working people um were just given this you know band-aid money and and told to drop it the way settlements, I think, should be handled is, here's your settlement, here's your money, here's your $11 million, and you need to start taking all of these uh, therapy classes or, or go to visit with a counselor, and, and over the years, as you heal, we'll be funding mm -hmm. as you get better, because why are you going to give $11 million to a person who is in that much pain and the only way they can soothe it or distract themselves from it is by spending and being excited over the money that they have. Um, so yeah, I'm interested to really to really get into that and kind of see what those effects were and 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 maybe kind of educate people on, on, on what demands they make when they're trying to, to get settlement money instead of saying, give me 10 million, we need to be saying, I want a lifetime, you know, I want a lifetime supply of counseling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 along with my money, and 
yeah, you can take it from those proceeds until I'm well, or or you can, or we can fight for you to pay it, and I still get my proceeds, but I can't have access to them under duress, under mental stress, and under the loss of a child. I have to graduate, and I have to I have to heal my mind, my spirit, my soul, and as I'm doing this, you guys can fund me and fund the therapy because uh, giving somebody a bucket of gold while they're in that much pain is just counterproductive. No. Yeah, well, yeah. I, one thing I do want to point out is though I am more than certain that the families weren't involved in those numbers. Well, that's that, disgusting. Right? That I'm, I'm pretty sure... They had to have had representation. Yeah, they, 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 yes, they had representation. I'm think, I don't think the lawyers are like, how much money do you want? Yeah. I'm pretty sure... They were just negotiating directly on their behalf. Yeah, on their behalf. So I don't think they had like an input as a number or whatever. Yeah. I think it because I think that the lawyers themselves are looking at a payday, yeah. and and so they're looking at a number that they like because they're going to get. I mean, it should be thirty, but in some places in this in, in that in this case, forty to almost fifty. They were wow. taking, and so like I think they were negotiating a number, not like with the family there. I think they were negotiating a number that they were gonna, you know, that, that what they, they were gonna yeah, get. They were landing their pockets. Yeah, they they basically. Um, um, I remember reading this article like how about a uh, um, I forgot what they call them, but people that help lawyers like get cases. You know, you know, it's ambulance chasing. Um, this guy was a former EMT, and he managed to get like and they give you percentages of how many clients you brought in. And this guy made so much money, like a Picasso in his living room and oh, stuff geez. like that. And he was just a runner. That's what they're called, runners. And so he had a Picasso, and he was just a runner. <laughs> yeah, he was just a runner. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that is insane. Yeah, I think I think that the aspect of of like the the always the greedy lawyers mm -hmm. that they come in and they they take advantage mm -hmm. of the people because they didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's just it's just yeah. but a I will, disgusting thing. I will add that you know I met two, honestly, and they were like very emotional about it. So I mean I'm not going to say all of them were like that. Do you think that that over the years that that's they started. Playing it back in their head, I, and then from that, I'm not sure. All I know is that um, to, both of them told me the same thing: that it haunted their lives forever. Wow. Representing the children who died, or taking money and, that they or didn't representing deserve. them. No, uh, that's bullshit. I call bullshit on whoever okay, told you that, that because if I'm an attorney and I represent you well, mm -hmm. and I don't price gouge, and I don't do anything that is immoral to the situation then I don't have guilt. I did, and I got you what what we could get you. If there is a, a, an attorney out there who represented these children who feels guilty. Mm -hmm. feel I'm not sure if it was guilt. I think it was the it, the situation they were in. Impacted them. Yeah. It, well, I mean. I, That's the way he they, it was presented to me by both of them on separate occasions. There's two different lawyers. They told me that it had always haunted them. You know, to deal with that case. Um, wow. I'm not sure, like you said, if it was over years now it haunts them. Yeah, but they no, said, no. you know, they both said the same thing that over time that they had never left their minds that it had always haunted them. Well, How many lawyers had their hands in? This uh, case? I don't know the exact number. To be honest with you. Um, I really don't know the exact number because you could also say like how many lawyers started and then how many lawyers ended, ended. because yeah. because some were taking clients from each other. Wow. In fact, one of the craziest stories I heard well, it had to involve LULAC, which is the, um, the you know, Latino civil rights organization. Um, the accident happens, and the lo local president, um, Jose de Lara, hears about it, and he hears that some you know, people are being taken advantage of. And so he sends his lawyer, LULAC's lawyer, it's his lawyer and LULAC's lawyer, down with a group to go and you know, make sure they're not being taken advantage of. And then somehow the guy acquires some <laughs> some of the clients from some other lawyers. So that becomes a lawsuit between them. And what's really crazy is I'm researching this Son is they bitches, start man. they start going through like records and stuff because of the lawsuits that they find out there's I think thirty thousand dollars of missing money from Lulac and they have to dissolve Lulac and recreate it after that. Oh, it's all big, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's 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 Gage said it in our yeah. last uh, in in our documentary, man. It, it's profit over people, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's bullshit and the attorneys who participate in it and who indulge and bask in it they need the, the, they, they i'm disgusted with them man I, I they should be behind bars and you had yeah. firsthand yeah i was gonna with say with that because yeah, how many yeah. lawyers were oh, oh yeah i never there, asked there you was, 
Like, um, did you get approached by a lot of? No, I I was sucked into the vortex from from the beginning, like he, man. He like, got you, and he got us. He knocked on because when we got put into those rooms at the mm-hmm. police department, they closed the shutters. They like they didn't want letting anybody in or out. And hours and hours after being questioning, we can hear somebody banging on the shutter doors. Finally, they open it, and lo and behold, it's my savior. It's my attorney, <laughs> who I had never met before. Yeah. You know, who I had absolutely no idea who he was other than he was Roland's wife's boss. So he freed me from where I felt I was imprisoned. I was grateful. I signed. Yeah, you represent me. And you didn't get any other phone call? Something I never oh, asked my you. my goodness, yeah. We got phone calls day and night from attorneys yeah. and from and from friends who worked with attorneys. Yeah. And Robert, I saw you on the news. Are you represented? Leave him. Come with us. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, and, it's, and it's, it sucks because um, it really tarnishes the integrity that should come with being an attorney. Yeah. What, what, would, what do you feel at that time? Because I think I can correlate what they were feeling. Mm-hmm. Like, how did you feel like when people were reaching out to you, like, go with this attorney, go with this, no, go with my attorney? Honestly, man, it, it, it's, it's irrelevant to the bus because mm-hmm. people were suffering from the loss of life mm-hmm. and things of that personally when they were getting these calls. To me, I hadn't lost anybody, thank goodness, that night. I had seen and witnessed a lot of things. So for me to get the calls, I was very young. I still felt very detached from the tragedy. Mm -hmm. These people were calling me, giving me praises, saying you're a hero, we wanna represent you. It was was more of a flattering thing Mm -hmm. for me. But then as soon as I told Frank Enriquez, he was like, you, you need to tell anybody who calls you from now on asking about this event that they need to call your attorney. You can't answer any questions because then I can sue you for breach of contract with wow. me. And as soon as you told me that, that's exactly what I did. Yeah. So, again, 21 years old, I had, I thought I had financial <laughs> knowledge. I didn't. But I, I thought that I knew what I was doing. Um, these individuals at the Alton <laughs> bus accident were given vast amount of money, money that they would have it would have taken them generations and generations to acquire almost some of them come from that humble beginnings is is like giving a child a a loaded gun and and hoping that they just learn how to use it with no guidance and and that everything works out wow yeah and going back to like how crazy it was um i remember um, hearing descriptions that like when they get to the hospital to the gurney and you'd reach your hand in the sheets you'd pull out handfuls of lawyer cards it was so bad that the um, the bar association had to send down a crisis team because they were like there were so many um, shouts of barratry, which is ambulance chasing. Mm-hmm. Um, several lawyers get indicted. None of them go to jail. The only one found who, who goes to jail is a secretary. <laughs> yeah, that's bullshit. That, man. Wow, that is crazy, that's, man. That makes me sick. I got a lot of friends who are attorneys, man. I hope none of you guys are like that. Mm, if I find out, <laughs> we're going to have words because, God, that's so disgusting, man. These are children. Yeah. The fat mothers and fathers. Yeah, and you can also who think lost about it. children dealing with mm. these sons of bitches who are just like, in, in like a here, pick me, pick me so that we can. Yeah, I know that that's uh, and and to the attorneys, I don't know how many of them are alive, but those of you who all who charged fifty percent to some of these families plus your fees and your expenses, just I mean, just shame on you, man. I I, uh, I know you sleep well because it's a, an expensive mattress, but uh, but wow, man, these families that they took advantage of um, is gente nuestra, you know, is gente de aquí. Yeah. And I think that um, maybe part of like those high percentages and them not noticing is, I mean, they're in shock. They're not thinking straight. They didn't know they, anybody. And maybe they want the phone calls to stop the people. Yeah. You know, just, you know, make everything else stop. I think there's a lot of intimidation there, mm-hmm. too, man. You're intimidated over the fact that you don't know how you're going to pay for the funeral. Mm-hmm. You don't know how you're going to go to work and continue to provide. You don't know because of all of the duress that you're under and the stress. Your your life, what we live and breathe for, has been taken from you. Mm-hmm. As you were sending it off to go better itself and become yeah. something better than who you are. And it was snatched right from under you. And you're still expected to pay every bill, do your duties as a mother, father, or older brother, sibling, whatever, and go to work while mourning. So, yeah, I can see how an attorney could come in here and say, here, 
I'll Sign take care this, of it for and you. And I'm going to give you this. I'm going to talk to your job. Tell them that you're not going to be at work for a while, but don't worry. I'm going to pay your bills. I'm because I got a lot of that mm-hmm. too. Um, it's it's just disgusting, man. It, it really is. I, I get that they don't they need somebody to reach out to them because sometimes we just don't know who to call. Um, but that's just that's just shady of those people to do that and what uh, what one major impact that we feel today legally like you know like i told you the buses mm-hmm. but let's talk you know legally on lawsuits is um and i write this in my book in december of that year I mean, this happens in um septem- september september sub- december the year before um the amigo store collapsed i don't know if you guys know that mm-hmm. story it it's was not. a three-story building in brownsville it was a shop and a flat roof and it rained real hard, and it pancaked down, it's killing all these people. so many bells in my head, yeah. but I can't. I and can't so there where were a lot of lawsuits from that in running through the courtroom, and then there were the lawsuits from from Alton running through the courts, and you know, and it was lawsuit, lawsuit, lawsuit. So then this big campaign happens, um, uh, you know, about lawsuit abuse, and so they start putting caps. On, and they pass a lot of cap lawsuits. And the end result of that is nowadays it is actually really difficult to like, you know, let, um, I worked in healthcare for years, like um, for uh, if you sue a doctor or something. You kept at 250. They, they're caps. So it almost becomes to a point where lawyers won't even take the case anymore because it's not worth it. Hmm. And so there's people getting away with all kinds of stuff because it's not even worth taking the case anymore wow. because these caps and these caps are put in because of the lawsuits. They use that as like an advertising, oh, lawsuit abuse. Law. Like that's not a lawsuit abuse. That, that was major yeah. loss of life. That's why you have so many cases. But they make it sound like it was just rampant, but like it was two episodes, you know, and there was just a lot of people. But now because of the caps that come out of that, you know, you malpractice suits are actually lower because – you know, you, it's hard to find a lawyer who that will actually take the case because on. it's not really worth it yeah, monetarily. If, if you get best case scenario, mm-hmm. two hundred and fifty thousand, less than thirty three percent, your doctor, your and then whatever they spend to whatever their expenses yeah, are, yeah, to there's try the case. Yeah. And you're looking at medicines, so you have to hire expert way. witnesses. Yeah. You have to hire people that you know are going to cost you money, and so, it, so it's a, it's literally a loophole to protect the doctors. Mm-hmm. Huh? Interesting. Wow. Well, with that being said, guys, we're going to continue this. We're going to continue diving into this. Uh, I think it's such an interesting story, man. I think with with your help, we can get maybe some other people on that were directly affected mm-hmm. with this because mm-hmm. we'd love to chat with them. And I know, how, how many years ago? 33? It was, yeah, 33 now because my book came out on the 30th anniversary. Wow. So 33 years ago, one of the most tragic accidents happened in Alton and, and laws have been passed because of that. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, Get into the comments, guys. We we really want to explode this just like we did with the Queen Isabella. I think um, this is a story that that rings true to our culture right here in the Rio Grande Valley. And with Juan's help, we'd love to share the story. I'm excited, Juan. Thank you for I'm sharing. happy to do it. Awesome. We'll see you guys. Take care. Yeah.